Psalm 27 today, as we look into the Word of God, as we talk on the subject of fear. A couple of weeks ago, I <clears throat> preached on the subject of worry, and certainly those two subjects are sisters, you could say. Worry and fear kind of go hand in hand, and they do have a great deal in common, but I think we can also differentiate the one from the other. There are some subtle differences between worry and fear, even though they go closely together. But let's look at Psalm 27, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And the psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me upon a rock." There's a story about a knight who was getting ready for a journey. And this knight was the kind of person who feared everything. And he tried to prepare himself for his travels. And so he tried to imagine just about every conceivable danger that might present itself as he traveled along. And so, of course, he had his armor and his sword in case he met some unfriendly folk. He had an axe for chopping wood. He had ointment for sunburn or poison ivy. I mean, he had a tent, blankets, pots and pans, and the oats for his horse. I mean, everything you can imagine. And he finally starts taking off on his journey, and he's going down the road just clanging and clanging and banging and bashing. Just sounds like a moving junk pile, you know what I'm saying? Well, as he travels along, he comes to his old dilapidated bridge that he has to cross. And he gets about halfway across, and some boards give way, and he and his horse tumble into the river, and they drown. What are you laughing for? You're supposed to go, aw. I know some of you are more sad about the horse, but anyway. But in all his preparation, you see, he failed to account for the fact that he might just need some type of flotation device. You know, no matter how much we fret about the future, no matter how much we imagine trouble that may come upon us, we can never be fully prepared. And, say, and, and fate almost laughs in our face, as if to say, all right, you've thought of that possibility, but there's another one over here that hasn't even crossed your mind. And fear can just grip us because of all the possibilities that this world seems to hold for us. The Bible in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Do you know what Jesus' most often repeated command was in the Gospels? And a lot of people might say, well, probably don't steal or don't kill or, or, or don't lie, but his most often repeated command was fear not. He said that more than any other command. In fact, that command, not to be afraid, not to fear, appears in every single book of the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Every book of the Bible tells us not to be afraid. Two weeks ago when I preached on worry, I made the comment that worry is a thief because worry robs us of peace and joy and a sense of well-being. Well, if worry is a thief, then I would say that fear is a bully. Because fear just taunts us. Fear just pushes us around. Fear mocks us. And so if worry is a thief, then fear is a bully. And it intimidates us and causes us to cower before life and before tomorrow and before all that the world has to offer. 
So we're going to look at Psalm 27 in a little bit, but before we get there, I want to lay out three fear facts. All right, before we get to Psalm 27, just some general thoughts uh, on the subject of fear that we ought to consider as we, as we move on. The first fear fact is that some fear is necessary for the preservation of life. In other words, not all fear is necessarily bad. In, in fact, the Bible even tells us we're to fear God, right? We're to fear God. That, the Bible says that fearing God is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, and so we're to fear the Lord. That doesn't mean we're to cower in His presence or to run away from Him in that sense, but it means we're to have a reverential awe before Him, that we are to respect His authority in our lives. It's that type of fear. Not a fear where we're afraid of Him in that sense. But there's also the fear that God gave us to preserve life. In 1 John 4 and verse 18, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. But a lot of people misquote that verse. In fact, there are even some translations that will say perfect love casts out all fear. But that's not what it says. You look in the original language and the word all, A-L-L, -L, is not there. God doesn't want to cast out all fear from your life. Perfect love casts out carnal fear, the fear that paralyzes us, but there's some fear that we need to have. If God put certain fear into you for a reason. That's why you run if a bear is chasing you, or play dead, or if an alligator is after you. Like, that happens every day, but you never know. But that's, that's what that fear is. That's why if you see a, a you know, car coming towards you, you, you swerve, because you don't want to have that impact. God gave you that preservation. I, I went, when I was a, a kid, I got bit by a dog, and I still got a scar from it, a uh, really cool looking scar. Had to get, I was proud of it when I was a kid, you know, and I had to get some stitches and all that. It wasn't as ferocious as I might try to make it sound here today, but I, I remember getting kind of trapped, and this dog came up to me. I knew it was a ferocious dog because it belonged to one of my relatives, but I didn't realize I was going to encounter it that day. And when he came up on me, I, I thought maybe he might be a Church of God dog. Yeah, that's where my hopes were lying. I thought, maybe he's a Church of God dog, you know. But I soon found out that not only was he not a Church of God dog, this dog wasn't even saved. You know what I'm saying? Because he, he ripped into me pretty good. But I was able to get a way of escape. And see, it was that fear factor that made me look for a route out, you see. Because God placed that in us. And so if there's something that causes you to fear in that regard, well, that's a good thing. Otherwise, we'd all walk right out in the middle of traffic and get hit by cars right and left if we had absolutely no fear at all. And so God has placed that fear in us for a reason to preserve life. So some type of fear that way is a good thing. A second fear fact is that there are two primary categories of fear. And some people might make more, but I'm going to just talk about two. Gallup poll did a survey of greatest fears that people have. And, and here's what they ranked as fears. We go to the next screen there, Pastor John. And I'm not putting these up in any particular order, but those I'm sure look very familiar to you. Some people are afraid of heights, snakes, mice, thunder, all those different things. I'm not going to preach about those today. All right. In fact, if you're afraid of snakes, God bless you. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's all right with me. I, I'm not going to say don't be afraid of snakes. That goes back to that life preservation thing. Um, but, you know, some of those things, maybe if you have those, maybe you need to work through some of them. Maybe a psychologist can help you. I don't know. But, um, that's not my primary area of concern today. Someone else did an article about a different kind of fear that we have. And that, this is what I'm really going to talk about. And they ranked the top ten fears that we have. And these are the ones that, as he talked about, that are more internal. These aren't, these aren't related to things around us. But these are the fears that we're going to talk about today. These, these are the types of fears, really, that the Scriptures talk about. And we can identify with a lot of these, can't we? The fear of being alone, the fear of death, of course, fear of failure, ridicule, disappointment, all these things. You, know, you, you look at that list, I'm sure there are several on there that you can identify with. Even if not right now, maybe sometime in the past when you've had to deal with these types of fears in your life, they can sometimes paralyze us. Sometimes the fear of the unknown can prevent us from, from living today fully in the peace of God, you see. And so these fears can really paralyze us. And so we're going to kind of try to address some of these, not individually, of course, but just talk about general fear in our lives when we, when we look at Psalm 27 here in a moment. The third fear fact is that courage is courage 
because of the reality of fear. What I mean by that is, if fear comes upon you, look at it as an opportunity to exhibit courage. See, I have this fear in my life, but if you can overcome it and find strength, then courage will win the day, you see. And if you look at the scriptures, and, and even in our present day, behind almost every great act of courage, there is often a seed of fear. Because the reason we call it courage is because someone did something in the face of fear. In Joshua 1 and verse 8, when God told Joshua to be strong and courageous, why do you think God told him that? Because God knew that he was going to be coming up against some life-threatening situations. The odds were going to be stacked against him. And he would be facing situations where he could lose his life, where Israel could cower and turn back. But God said, be strong and courageous. Because he knew he was going to be confronting obstacles. You see, if it was going to be a walk in the park for Joshua, God would have said, have a good day. But he knew, you see, that it was going to be difficult. He knew it was going to be challenging. And that there were going to be things he was going to confront that might bring about fear. And so God says, be strong and be courageous. And so when you confront fear in your life, realize that God can make you courageous and strong. It's an opportunity to exhibit courage. Somebody said that courage is a fear extinguisher. I like that. See, i got a corny sense of humor. You can tell, huh? Well, let's look now at Psalm 27. Psalm 27, and I want to talk some things that we can do, things that the scriptures teach for us to, to do, in order for us to overcome fear. Some of these may have similarities with worry that we talked about before, but, but a little bit different too. Let's talk about this, Psalm 27. Fear is vanquished when God is your strength. The very first verse of Psalm 27 says, God is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? God is the what? Remember? The strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is my strength. In order for us to overcome fear, in order for it not to paralyze us, we need to have our strength in the Lord. We have to realize it doesn't come from just self-will. It doesn't come from our own resolve. It doesn't come from us just, uh, just kind of forcing ourselves. It comes from the strength of the Lord. And so the first step, of course, I think is for a person to know Jesus as Savior. I think that's obviously the first point. That's not to say that people that don't know Jesus can't have courage. I think we've seen in many examples of people who don't know Christ who have exhibited courage. But I do believe that we are at a greater advantage, don't you? When we know Jesus as our Savior, because then we have the strength of the one who parts seas. We have the strength of the one behind us who raises the dead. We have the strength of the one behind us who knows everything and can do anything. And so we are definitely at a tremendous advantage in knowing the Lord as our Savior. So that's certainly the first step. When you know Jesus, your strength is bolstered right there. That's a tremendous advantage in knowing the Lord as Savior because he gives us strength that is beyond just what the flesh can do beyond just what we can muster in and of ourselves. And so let your strength be in the Lord. He is our strength. Lean on Him. Which brings me to the second thing. Fear is vanquished when God is your refuge. In verse 5 of Psalm 27, it talks about hiding in Christ, that He is our refuge. And when you think of a refuge, think, what is a refuge but a, a place of shelter? A place of safety. You think of it like a cleft of the rock. Where you can hide and be protected. That's what God wants to be for us. I've always loved Psalm 46. If you're not familiar with Psalm 46, look it up sometime this week. It says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, and the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. He says, God is our refuge. And see, this is the only way we can really overcome fear is by resting in the Lord and finding our refuge in Him and letting Him protect us, being our strong tower that we run to. His being our refuge is, is the key. 
We've got to find our strength and our refuge in Him. And so a lot of it has to do with turning our thoughts toward the Lord. See, a lot of times when we're fearful, it's kind of like what I talked about with worry. We're thinking about the future. We're thinking about what might be. We're thinking about the uncertainty. We're thinking about the trouble that could come upon us when we need to focus on the Lord. And I've mentioned Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but I want to add a little bit to that. Not add to the scripture, but add another one. Because uh, verse 8, but let's put four and, verses 6 and 7 on the screen. And these are familiar verses probably to most of you. Where Paul said, don't be anxious for anything, but by everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Well, usually when we quote those verses, that's where we stop, right? Most of the time, when we're looking at Philippians 4, we quote verses 6 and 7. But remember verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, he's telling us what to think about. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just. You notice he's not saying whatever terrible tragedies might happen. He's not saying that. He says whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. A lot of it's centering our thoughts on the good things. And if the devil puts bad thoughts in your head about, well, this could happen tomorrow, or this might happen to that person, you've got to banish the thought. You remember in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, says taking every thought into captivity? That's what you've got to do. You've got to grab that thought and say, that's a thought from the devil. That's not from God. And give your thoughts to the Lord. Think on good things. And run to Him as your refuge. Say, Lord, these fears are paralyzing me. They're just ruining my heart. And run to Jesus. You see, when we fear, we get a, a type of spiritual amnesia. In that we forget all the miracles God has done. We, we seem to get focused, well, this still could happen, or what if this happens? And we, so we, we forget about all the times God has delivered us. It's kind of like when you get mad at your spouse, you forgot all the good things they've done for you all their lives, you know. <laughs> And when we start fearing about things, we forget how wonderful God is and all of His mighty power and all the things He's done for us, you know. And trusting in the Lord brings all that back. All right, number three. This is, I think, and they're all three important. I think it really comes down to this. Fear is vanquished when God is your confidence. Verse three, he said, in this I will put my confidence. Or another way of thinking this is, is your trust in the Lord. Putting your trust in the Lord. And, and, Letting him be who he is without, without worry that he's not going to take care of you because he is. That's why we put everything in his hands, like the psalm said. And we trust in him. I know sometimes faith is trusting God because of what we have seen. But sometimes faith is trusting in God in spite of what we have seen. Because there are a lot of things that happen in this world that we can't explain. There are a lot of things that happen in this world that quite honestly, are calls for concern. But we still trust God. And really the bottom line comes down to it when we're fearful and fear is dominating our lives, really the, the bottom line question is, do you trust God? I mean, really trust God. Do you trust God to hold you up? Do you trust God to settle you down? Do you trust God to undergird you? Do you trust God to provide? Do you trust Him to be there for you? Do you trust Him to give you grace when things are tough? How deep is our trust? And obviously, if you're a Christian, you trust Him for salvation. You've been saved. Your heart's been born again. But do, you, but do you trust Him for the future? And do you trust that no matter what happens, His grace will be there for you? I want to read this one piece to you. Just about life in general. It's so true. There are no absolute guarantees. You know, when you think about the future, about what could happen, what if my spouse dies? What if my child dies? What if... What if my health fails? And what if my finances disappear? But listen to this. There are no absolute guarantees, no risk-free arrangements, no fail-safe plans. Life refuses to be that neat and clean. But listen to this. You cannot run scared. Running scared invariably blows up in your face. All who walk risk stumbling. All who run risk falling. All who drive risk colliding. All who live risk something. 
Do you want to know the shortest route to anxiety and ineffectiveness? Then start running scared. <laughs> Just start running scared. Try to cover every base at all times. Become paranoid about what's in front of you, what's behind you, what's around you. Think about every possible peril, every conceivable danger. Concern yourself with the what-ifs. Expect the worst all the time. Play your cards close to the vest and let fear run wild. And if you do all those things, you'll have plenty of anxiety, a lot of unrest, and you'll be paralyzed to the point you just can't function in the will of God. And to go along with this, a playwright named Sophocles said this. Listen to the statement. He said, to him who is in fear, everything rustles. Think about that. To him who is in fear, everything rustles. And imagine being out camping and you're scared out of your mind. Every leaf that rustles, you think is a snake or a bear, something. When you live in fear about the future, about the unknown, every phone call makes you nervous. Every activity makes you scared. Every thought turns to a nightmare. God doesn't want you to live that way. God wants to take that fear away from you and help you to live in peace. Now, let me, let me just get real with you, okay? Because I, I, I don't want to just give you a bunch of platitudes. I know life can be tragic. And we all know that. And the worst case scenario can happen because you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, but pastor, what if? I mean, what if something did happen to one of my children? What if my spouse did die or, or get incapacitated with illness? What if my health failed? What, what if, what if, what if? So I know those things can happen, right? We all know that. And it comes back to trusting God to know that he will give you the grace. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that it's going to be an easy thing, right? Nobody would say that. But we just have to trust that His grace would keep us. I've seen many Christian people who have suffered some of the things that I'm talking about. Some of you are here today. And God's given you the grace. And you're a testimony to that. In fact, I want to share something with you this, uh, this week. This happened. Um, someone from my home church in Huntington. I've known her... Most of my life, uh, she was a year or two ahead of me in high school, and she went to my home church, Trinity Church of God, her name is Teresa. And the other night, her eight-year-old grandson was playing soccer, and he had a seizure, and he died that night. And Teresa posted this on Facebook today. She said, this is our worst nightmare. But she said, continued prayers, please. And thanks so much for the ones that have already been said. We wouldn't have made it this far without them. She said, listen to this. this getting home from the hospital Thursday night, I've made up my mind to go to bed and stay there forever. But through the grace of God, we are taking one minute at a time. We'll love to all. You notice she didn't say one day at a time. She didn't say one hour at a time. She said one minute at a time. But you know, it may be that you've had tragedies happen in your life where you thought, I just want to go home, go to bed, and never wake up, never get out of bed, whatever. But if you trust in the Lord, He'll give you the grace, even if it's just one minute at a time. Even if it's just one minute at a time. So why am I saying that? Because it does absolutely no good to fear. I mean, even if Teresa, let's say she had feared for her grandsons for eight years, it wouldn't have made today any easier. It would have made those eight years worse, you see. So all that fear about what could happen to somebody you love, I'll be honest with you, when my kids were little, it wasn't a paralyzing fear, but I used to often wonder, what if something happened to one of them? I loved them so much, you know, just like any other parent would love his kids. And that was a recurring thought. And like I said, it wasn't a paralyzing thing, but it was just there. Until finally I just gave it to God and said, you know what, they're not my kids anyway. They're God's kids. 
and he's just entrusted them to me for a while, and they're in his hands. Because I can do everything in the world to protect them. I could duct tape them to a wall, you know, so nothing happens. I duct tape them to a wall for no reason. No, just kidding. But, you know, I can do everything I could, but something can still happen. And so you just have to come to a point where they're God's kids, they're not yours. And you just can't let that destroy you. I want to close with this thought from D.L. Moody. He was a 19th century evangelist. And he said, you can either go to heaven first class or second class. Now, you, as a Christian, you'll go to heaven. But he said, in your heart of hearts, you'll either go first class or second class. And you know, first class, man, if you've flown, you know first class is way much better than second class, all right? You say, what are you talking about? Well, let, let's look. Uh, let's put that on the Psalm 56 and verse 3. He said, this is second class. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Okay, now this is a good thing. This is a good thing, right? If you're afraid, trust in the Lord. That's what we're talking about this morning. If fear comes upon you, trust in the Lord. That's a good thing. If fear comes, run to Jesus. Let him be your refuge. But he said, this is first class. Same chapter, eight verses later, he says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid. See the difference? Those two verses are in the same chapter. And he said, you can go second class, and when the fear comes upon you, 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 you trust in the Lord. And that's good. That's good. But wouldn't you rather go first class? So that you trust in the Lord that you're not afraid. And don't let the fear be debilitating. Now, it might take a little while. Fear has been a dominating force in your life. It might take a little while to get to verse 11. But I want to encourage you to start that journey if you haven't already. To get to that point where your first thought isn't fear. You just say, Satan, be gone. Resist the devil. And let the thoughts of the Lord and his refuge and peace be upon you. Let's stand together as we pray. Our dear Lord, how thankful we are that you are our strength, that you are our refuge, that you are our confidence. Lord, one thing we all know that this world offers a lot of them is uncertainty. You even said it in the scriptures that we don't know what a day may bring forth. But Father, we also know from experience and from your word that allowing the, the fears of uncertainty, the fears of tomorrow haunt us can destroy our hearts, even our health, and of course our faith. So Father, help us to run to you. Help us, Lord, to, to trust in you. That even if the worst was to happen, which none of us wants, not only do we have you as our refuge, but we can look around this church of people who have made through two storms. And their lives are testimonies of what the grace of God can do, even in the midst of tragedy, so that we would not give up. Well, let your word secure our hearts today. Strengthen us and undergird us, we pray in Jesus.